Welcome to West Tonka Memories. I'm Pam Myers and I volunteer with the West Tonka Historical Society. Today I'm talking with Kathleen Kulberg. Kathleen, I've learned about you just a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. I've learned that you are an active preservationist and an avid house historian. Tell That's me a little true. bit about yourself. Well, actually, I didn't start off that way, but when I moved to Minnesota, I bought a 100-year-old house. Um, and since then, I've been very interested in the history of Minnesota. My native state was Pennsylvania, but Minnesota is very different from Pennsylvania and has a newer history, and I'm anxious to learn more about it. And house histories helped me to do that. Uh, as I delve into the history of a house, I learn about the people who lived there, what they did for a living, and how they participated in the community. Wonderful. Uh, we are excited to hear about the house history that you're going to share today. It's a house in Minnetonka Beach. That's correct. So uh, I will toss the ball to you. You go right ahead with your program. Thank you so much for coming today. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share this fun history of this house in, on Minnetonka Beach in on Arcola Lane. I'm calling my presentation the country home of a wealthy banker, for indeed it was built for a wealthy banker from North Dakota in 1904 at Minnetonka Beach. This is the home as it occurs, it appears, oh, about two years ago when I began my presentation and my research into this project. I was hired by a realtor from Coldwell Banker, uh, John Parker, who had sold this house to his sister who lives out east. And she was coming back home for the summer times and she wanted a home that she could restore, she could live in and for the, for the summertime to join her family. The house history is that it was a clabbered and single residence, two stories, built in 1904 for John Burkholz, um, high on the bluff above, I guess between the Arcola Bridge and the Lafayette Club. At the time it was built to fit into its landscape, hence you'll see the nice brick, uh, the stone footings here that are underneath that help anchor it to the house. You'll see that it has some uh, nice porches to allow some breezes to come in and capture those breezes. And this wide piazza or porch was a very targeted feature and design of the house as it was built. The Burkholzes lived in North Dakota in Grand Forks. As they would do, wealthy people would come uh, from Minnesota, et cetera, they would go out to Lake Minnetonka in the summer times and rent cottages or houses. This was the most popular thing to do. As they became more and more common and comfortable coming into town, they decided it was time to build their own house. And this is why this was selected as a location. It was convenient to the cities and all the activities that were going on there. In the summertime, it was convenient to everything that was happening uh, with Big Island and Excelsior and the Hotel Lafayette at that time. It was designed by um, Keith, and it was one of the things that Keith would do is he would quickly learn that it was more to his advantage to sell house plans than it was to actually build two or three houses in the summertime in Minnesota. And so he designed with his brother many, many houses. And in one year, he did over 700 houses and he would sell the plans. This house became one of the plans, number 914, in his issue of his own magazine called Keith's Home Builder in August of 1904. The house was described, this design primarily for a summer home or a country house has caused much favorable comment where it has been erected on the shores of one of Minnesota's most beautiful lakes. There are a number of unique features, the main one of the exterior being the magnificent porch with hammock space at left-hand corner, the post enabling one to fashion hammocks swinging to each other corner and leave the passageway behind the post so it is unnecessary to duck under the hammock ropes in order to pass. The interior is but little cut up, the magnificent main hall being the living room hall. The staircase at the end of Sam is especially handsome in design. The smoking alcove office room is a very pretty room and the dining room is richly wainscoted and further embellished with splendid china cases, sideboard and mantel built 
and all in harmony with the general design. The breezeway separating the kitchen and servants quarters from the main house, which is at the back of the house, forms a most delightful servants dining room and almost a necessary feature for a house to be occupied in warm weather, but can also be closed in entirely with glass. The port cashier is reached by going halfway down under the main staircase. And from the vestibule, there is a flight of cement steps leading down under the ground for a tunnel wide enough for two persons, which leads directly to the boathouse. Cost $9,000 to build. Again, looking at the house from the one side, we can see that the porches were indeed very wide. We can see in this picture here, oops, go back here. In this particular slide on the second floor, there is a curved balcony, which is also screened in. And there's two bedrooms behind this, which would allow for breezes to come in to the rooms upstairs because they didn't have air conditioning then. A later addition on the bedroom on the, the back side was this additional porch to gain access to, again, the breezes from the lake. As it was pictured in Keith's Home Builder magazine, the slide here on the left is showing how the layouts were for the first floor and second floor. Over here, I've turned the plan so that you can imagine as we're looking at the house from the front. This is the front entrance. Down here, we have the porch. We have the pork cashier that he refers to in his description. Carriages and cars would come up the driveway and unload their passengers here on this side. Then they would go to the main staircase and enter into the living room, the smoking room, the dining room. He alludes to the fact that the kitchen and the servants quarters are to the back here. Large kitchen, breezeway, which can be entirely enclosed in glass and separated from the main house. The second floor going up the stairs has two bedrooms in the front. Again, that nice round porch letting the breezes into each room. This other bedroom has that new porch addition off to the side. And then there was guest rooms in the back, linen closet, and some other sleeping quarters. Quite an open floor plan for its time. The architect was Walter Jewett Keith. He was born in Minnesota in 1866, and there's actually not much known of his early history before he's mentioned as occurring as a partner with Fred Dodge and his firm in 1890. He also had a brother named Max Keith. The two of them teamed up and decided to create these plan books where you could buy lots of plans and he would sell them all over the country. So then one year it was reported he made several million dollars just from selling his plans. And this is in 1900. So he teamed with his brother and they also created this magazine called Keith's Home Builder, which would share out plans, interiors, ideas for the housewife to do with her home, kind of very much like an early ladies magazine but catering to those who wanted to build their own houses. 1900 to 1903 was one of the largest building booms in Minnesota history. Coming after the depression of the 1890s, people were just anxious to start building houses. So this was a very popular magazine and very common to do. Some of his other commissions that Keith did was he built the Sumner McKnight Mansion on Park Avenue the George Christian home on Ferndale, which I believe is no longer there. Trinity Baptist Church in Lowry Hill, which is no longer there. Plaza Hotel, downtown Minneapolis, which was located in the conjunction of Hennepin and Lindale near St. Mark's Cathedral and the Walker Museum. That was actually torn down in the 1960s when they decided to dig down I-94 and 35W and build the Lowry Hill Tunnel. He also was responsible for the Powers Dry Goods Store, which having been here since the 1980s, I remember the Powers Store, and then it became the J.C. Penney Store, and I believe now it's Gabaday Commons. Picture on the left here is the Sumner Mansion, as it exists still on Park Avenue. He built his own home, the residence on Clifton Avenue, which is very near the Methodist Church, Hennepin Avenue, which you can see in the background in this photograph. And he built many, many other houses, including the ones that he sold for plans. 
I found these interesting photographs of Minnetonka Beach in, uh, I think it was the University of Minnesota. And these were taken from the DNR as overhead shots of the beach in the wintertime. And this is to kind of put in perspective where we are. So this is Minnetonka Beach here. The Lafayette Club, as it is, is now here. The Arcola Bridge comes over here. This was the original pathway for the uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railroad that James J. Hill built to go out to his land, which was the Lap, the Ap I'm sorry, the Lafayette Hotel. And so people would cross over the bridge on this roadway, railway, and they would cross over. And the destination, obviously, was the hotel. Our house subject here is off Arcola Lane, which is the previous railroad bed. And it's located right about in this area. Mr. Bocholtz bought like three to four lots and expanded his house to take up that whole space there. There's another view here on the right-hand side of, again, part of the beach coming over to Lafayette Club. And it, since our house is currently painted white, it's probably one of these two houses right here uh, that you can see from this nice shot looking at the bay. Well, if you were wealthy and living in Minneapolis or St. Paul, you didn't do your own interior design. You hired the best. And the best person to do that in Minneapolis was a well-known, very flamboyant designer named John Scott Bradstreet. He had been born in 1845 in Rhode Island, was educated in private schools there. And after graduation, he actually went to the Gorham Silver Factory in Rhode Island, and he was employed there, but not as a designer. He was actually working in the business office where he took up bookkeeping and I guess was somewhat doing some purchasing for them. It's understood that his health wasn't very good. And so he decided to, for some reason, come west, go to Minneapolis. With that time when the 17, I'm sorry, the 1870s and 1880s was kind of the wild west. It did tout that it had clean, fresh air if you were not well but it also had dirt on streets and rained a lot. There was a lot of uh, lakes, which also produced a lot of mosquitoes, but it was a burgeoning and upcoming neighborhood. And so he found a real good home here and he decided to, again, go into the furniture business and started in several locations. Eventually in 1903, he set up his own famous business called the Crafts House. Bradstreet traveled quite a lot during his career that he was here. Between the 1870s and 1900, he made at least six or seven trips on to the West, to Japan, to Korea, to China, and he was on shopping and buying trips. And this wasn't just hop on an airplane trip. This was, you had to take a train to Vancouver or San Francisco, board a boat, take a boat over to Honolulu, and then from Honolulu, it would go on to the sites in Japan or China. So it would be a several weeks journey going and coming back. So you had a lot of time to visit with people who were on the, the boat. Uh, his last trip that he took uh, to the Orient, he was in 1913 and he sailed from Japan back to the United States on the same ship that Frank Lloyd Wright was on. And Frank Lloyd Wright had just received his commission to design the famous Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. I'm sure that because they had time to spend together, they got to know each other and shared some ideas. Unfortunately, Bradstreet died the following year in 1914. I think from my personal point of view, because of his wanting to be a leading edge designer, had he lived much longer, he and Frank Lloyd Wright probably would have had some connection and maybe done some commissions as far as the prairie style and that type of furnishings to offer to his clients. Some of you in current history might remember that there's been a Bradstreet restaurant that's been downtown Minneapolis. It's also been out on Hennepin Avenue here in Lowry Hill. And this was named in honor of John Scott Bradstreet. He wasn't known just here in Minneapolis, but he was known throughout the United States. And he also traveled extensively in Europe as well. Because he didn't have time here in the States, often he became a more permanent resident of 
something known as the resident house, uh, the Judd House, which was located downtown Minneapolis. The house on the left-hand side here was the Judd House. It was a private residence built in Minneapolis in the 1870s in the Empire style. And if you were coming to visit Minneapolis, there really weren't many hotels that you could stay at. And so if you were wealthy. And so this family quickly learned to put up people in their house. He actually managed to stay in this house for about 15 years. And he was given carte blanche to do whatever he wanted to do with his rooms and subsequently the garden behind. This was located at Fifth Street in in 1925, um, the house was torn down because the city needed to make way for either building, expanding the Hennepin, what is now Hennepin County Hospital, or it was going to build the armory. The armory won out. So when you go downtown Minneapolis and you see the armory today, the Judd House actually took up that whole block and this was the house that was there. It was torn down in 1925, but not without a fight. It was so well built that it really took an extensive uh, crew to take it down. I just love looking at the cars here because one of the things they used the lot for was parking when they didn't have any other parking downtown. One of the things that, that Bradstreet was able to do is build a garden at the Judd House. And because he had gone very, very often to Japan, he became enamored with the Japanese aesthetics and traditions um, of building gardens. But that wasn't his first trip back in the 1870s was after Japan had just opened to the West and tourists, wealthy tourists were starting to come and they wanted to buy items, paintings, furniture, whatever, garden accoutrements to take back home. And Bradstreet was no different. But the artisans, in order to attract the tourists to buy from them, started building little garden vignettes near their buildings. And this was in Kyoto, Tokyo, uh, and other places that he was visiting on the tourist route. And so the garden on the left is actually the one that was built at the Judd House. It incorporated elements of traditional Japanese design in that there's boulders, there are, um, there's boulders here, we have lanterns, you can see a nice lady in the background here. This might even be Mr. Bradstreet himself, it's hard to say. This is known as a resting shade shed, this little building with the thatched roof. And of course there's water and waterfalls. But if you noticed, it's all jam packed into one little space. And this is what the tourists wanted and saw when they came back from their visits to, the, to Asia. Fast forward about 20 years, and seven trips to the Orient, Mr. Bradstreet has finally gotten the fact the traditional Japanese garden design is much more simple and very precise in what it does. And so on the garden on the right hand side is the one that he actually designed here at the craft house for himself. Much more simplified, elegant, it looks like it blends into the landscape. It still uses Japanese lanterns, it still uses water plants. And what is remarkable about this picture is this particular bridge is made out of planks from an ancient Japanese ship. Mr. Bradstreet had gone to the Columbian Exhibition in 1893. And he had gone to the Japanese pavilion and he had seen this particular bridge. Uh, and so he, he brought this back with him and because they were just dismantling everything after the exhibition. And actually, I wanna say that this was the 1903 Chicago exhibition where the Japanese had actually set up a wonderful presentation there and was very well attended. So in 1903, he bought this bridge and brought it back to um, put into his crafts house garden. So very different, very, uh, jumbled up here and then much more elegant and sophisticated. Bradstreet would also do slide shows for people who couldn't go with him to the Orient. And so this encouraged a lot of other people to build Japanese gardens. And I have identified probably six or seven gardens that he influenced and helped design, of which none exist today. 
except the one here at um, Arcola Lane. Another picture of him within the garden. To our homeowner now. Our homeowner was John Burkholz, the wealthy banker from North Dakota. But he was born in 1855 in Trenton, New Jersey to German immigrant parents. His father was a cooper in a brew house in New Jersey. After school, again, he was a young man who went west and he went to Chicago. And he was employed as a bookkeeper for the McCormick Harvester Company, which was the largest implement company in the United States at that time. I don't think John Deere had actually gotten as big at that point in time. And at that point in history, in the 1870s, 1880s, the United States was expanding west and was offering free land to those who would go west. And so for Minnesota, we have a lot of Swedish immigrants and German immigrants who have gone west and were starting to farm and ship their goods back to Chicago, the center pretty much of the universe. And James J. Hill was building his railroads everywhere. How this connects to John Burkholz is he saw opportunity and he went out to the Dakotas, to Nebraska and Minnesota, and he bought land along the railroad tracks. He also then started establishing banks. The wealthy farmers were now selling their goods and needing to purchase things and more land. And so he set up banks um, in quite a few cities and he advertised himself here as real estate, insurance, loan office, money always on hand to loan at lowest rates of interest. And some research has shown that most of the interest rates were like six and seven percent, could be as high as 10 percent. In 1981, he went back to Chicago and to visit, and he had met and married to Eugenie Andros Hill, who was a divorcee from Minnesota, and I think she was visiting her sister at this time. She was divorced, and she had two children with her first husband, John Hill. Then she married Burkholz. They went back to North Dakota, and in North Dakota, um, here for a second. In North Dakota, they led quite the life. And then the summer times, they would come to Minnesota, to Lake Minnetonka. The winter time, they would come live at the Plaza Hotel, which was owned by Walter Keith, and enjoy conversations about potentially moving to Minnesota. Well, Mr. Burkholz apparently met a young lady quite younger than himself, had an affair and had an illegitimate child with her. This was Wilhelmina Anderson. His wife found out about it and sued for divorce. So they divorced in 1915. He quickly married Wilhelmina and moved off to Los Angeles where he died in 1924. Miss Eugenie Andros was the wife in question and the last owner of the house through 1932. Her history, and I'm sorry, this is the only photo I can find of her at this point in time, and this comes from a history book of the women of North Dakota, kind of a biography. She was born in 1842 in Garnavilla, Iowa. Her father was a famous doctor, mostly because he was the first doctor legally licensed west of the Mississippi. And he had been born in Massachusetts, and he married to Eliza Bunker, and the name Bunker is not necessarily related to Archie Bunker, but is related to the famous Bunker Hill of Boston, because her distant family had actually owned Bunker Hill prior to the revolution. So Dr. Andros came west of the Mississippi, and he mostly worked with the Native Americans that were living here, and particularly the Winnebago tribe. And when that tribe was forced out of Iowa into Western Minnesota, he followed them. His wife died uh, when the, about the 1880s, but in the meantime, um, they didn't want their children being raised uh, in the wild west of Iowa. So they sent the two daughters that he had off to Wisconsin to a boarding school to be educated. And when they came back in 1849, um, Miss Eugenie here married quite young. She was only 16 or 17, married to John Hill, who was a local from Garnavillo. 
they had two children, Frederick Allen and Lilius. And then they moved across to Leroy, Minnesota, where John Hill operated a dry goods store. They divorced about 1970, 1875, sorry. And Hill left for California to the gold fields and to be an investment banker. Eugenie ended up in Chicago visiting her sister, Mary John Buchholz, and then came back to Minnesota and to Grand Forks where they set up quite the lifestyle and then built the house in Minnetonka Beach. Later in her life, as she, uh, the winters, she would be too cold. They went to Florida, she and her daughter, and she actually died in Palm Beach, but her body was sent back to Lakewood to be buried. From her previous marriage, Miss Burkholz had been married to John Hill. This was her daughter, Lilius Fern. She's quite the curvaceous lady, uh, a true hourglass figure, I would say, but quite lovely. And she was known as a contralto singer with a lovely voice. She lived in New York City, but would come spend the summers with her mother and stepfather at Minnetonka Beach and would entertain in the house, quite often uh, inviting various socialites to come and join them and just enjoy the cool breezes. Miss Armstrong had been married, I'm not sure if divorced or her husband died. She did not have any children. But in 1918, she did marry to Samuel Rossiter Betts, who was a very wealthy businessman from New York City. And his son was married to the heiress of the Woolworth fortune. So we do have a connection of some history there. Supposedly, John Philip Sousa, the March King, came to play at the house and to entertain and, and to play with um, and play for Lilius Armstrong in the house but I've yet to find that that actually happened. Um, to me, having the famous March King come to Minnetonka Beach would be such big news. that would be all over the newspapers, but I have yet to find anything related. I know he did come in the 1920s to dedicate Boche Tower downtown, and he wrote a march for that particular episode. And I think he was here in Minnesota prior to 1908, but again, I really haven't found much information that, that verifies that information. Well, let's go back to the house now. So we've set the stage with the players. So we have the architect, the designer, the owners, and some of the entertainment they did here. So as the house was originally slighted, these were photos that were taken by the Sweet Studios downtown Minneapolis. And they're very detailed, which I love. And it's most unusual to have I think, 12 photos of the exterior and interior of a house, particularly at this time. So the house is seated. Uh, a couple of things that are different from its previous setting in 1909 here versus what you see today. So one of the first things is you can see how it's anchored to the ground. There's lots of trees in front of the house which don't exist today. And the house appears to be painted a darker color and trimmed in white trim and black uh, trim around the storm windows. I did talk to a grandson of the next owner of this house, and he did say he thought the house was painted dark green uh, with, black, with white trim. And in the picture here on the right-hand side, you can see this porch on the second floor. You can see the screened-in porch as it was established. Another thing that's noted here is there's a roadway in front of the house and a driveway up to the Port Cashier. Today, if you go to this house, there's only a footpath. The road has actually been moved down to in front of the lake, which is about 20, 30 feet down below grade here. There's also the driveway on the right-hand side, which doesn't exist anymore either. And you'll notice this is a little round window here in the stone foundation. That is actually going to the tunnel. If you remember in my description, I mentioned that the tunnel was a brick tunnel, 140 feet long out to the boathouse. This was a round window that allowed light to come into that tunnel from this location. So if you were driving here to come up for the day, you would uh, enter here, get dropped off at the port cashier and go into the living room and continue. Another view from the side of the house 
This is the, I guess I would call it the west side, side porch and a garden looking out to the lake. Then from inside the piazza, the, the large porch area, we can see the screened in porch, the view to the lake, and the hammock area that was described in the house being hanging on posts so that you can go around the post. You can go around the post. The hammocks are hung and you don't have to duck underneath them. So it's some lovely views and you can just imagine just sitting out there swinging on the hammock on a hot night and just enjoying the breezes coming in off the lake. Some more views of that same area uh, looking to the west. And then this is a view looking to the east. And what's notable in this picture on the right hand side is the Japanese garden. You can just see a hint of it right over here. There's some herbing, there's a lantern here, the neighbor's house belonging to the Gregories. The Gregories also had behind them a log cabin back in the woods here that you can't see in this picture. And that's notable because I will be reading you. Um, an article here of how they entertained at this particular point in time on this beach here. So if you can imagine, back to the description of the house, Lake Minnetonka residents look with pride on the steadily increasing summer colony and on its many handsome homes which have been erected within the past two years. One of the latest additions and one which makes a remarkable beauty spot on the shore is the summer home of Mr. and Mrs. John Burkholz at Minnetonka Beach. The attractions of the lake proved very alluring and the family soon persuaded to take up its permanent summer residence at the lake. Last fall, Mr. Burkholz, now this will be in 1903, purchased a great deal of land situated on the shore where the spacious homes of the Sextons, Tudhills, Hogmans, and other well-known Minneapolis residents are located. The magnificent home is now almost complete and will be occupied next week. A piazza of enormous size, large enough to hold an entire cottage, surrounds the front of the house, running over towards the south side. Hot air and hot water heating plants are in the basement to heat the house in fall and early winter. For their visits, they plan to visit the lake in the, those seasons. It is the only house which has a submarine passage and this is so well and thoroughly built that it will stand the attacks of any element and in case of necessity will offer protection from a cyclone. The passage is about eight feet high and is cemented solidly. It is 140 feet long and leads from the broad staircase of the hallway to the basement and to the boathouse on the water's edge. So the interiors Again, were designed by John Scott Bradstreet. And these are in a much more subdued, probably lake relaxing attitude. Bradstreet was known for exuberant layer upon layer of, of interiors. And I think as a result of the Columbian exhibition and also the 1903 Chicago exhibition, people, the colonial architecture was becoming very popular and stayed that way for many, many years. And so that was a more simplistic approach to interiors. The house on the left, therefore, doesn't have tall bookcases. It allows more wall space to bring in light. Uh, there are mirrors to reflect the light. There's less furniture, less carpeting. You'll notice the stenciling along the ceilings. In the back here is the main staircase, which is much broader than this. It's a, a curved type staircase that goes from the Porcashire upstairs to the second floor. The right hand side is a separate view of the living room and this is looking towards the smoking alcove that he describes in that Keith describes and you can just see a hint in the background of the dining room. There's a fireplace in the dining room and there's a sideboard here and a fireplace back here. Again, it's remarkable to have these photographs from this time period. The reception room or smoking room alcove on the left here had a built-in banquette, which is still there. And I must say, having been in this house several years ago um, when it was sold, 
this house is remarkably intact from what you see here. It has not changed very, very much, which considering the number of families have lived here is a testament to the fact that the house is very livable. So on the left-hand side, again, get the mouse to work here, we have the, the smoking alcove looking into the dining room. And in the dining room, you can see the round table, the sideboard, and a mural. On this side, we're in the dining room, probably positioned in front of the fireplace. And we're looking at a built-in sideboard, which again is very low, but not a tall sideboard, has a mirrored backdrop. The fireplace around has delft blue and white tiles. To complement that, the designer had painted in here a mural above the sideboard in blue and white doing the delft tiles. So you can see those um, here right in the picture. Right now, those are painted over. The present homeowner is trying to determine if it can be uncovered or just repainted in that fashion. She's determined to restore the house to this the glory that you actually see here today. Remarkably too, the lighting fixtures were saved. Some were put into a different room. Um, this one stayed intact. And what's remarkable about this is it's not broken. And it's a combination of gas and electric. So you can see these light fixtures. It is in a beautiful uh, stained blue lighting here with fringe. And it's created in what we call the Egyptian revival style. By this time in the 1890s going into 1900, Egypt was all the rage. People were going there and discovering all kinds of antiquities. And so Egyptian revival furniture, clothing, jewelry, was all the rage. And this lamp has some heads of ladies that have uh, cobras on, on their heads, you know, in that traditional Japanese. And these are mounted around the chandelier. We know that Bradstreet did this interior because he also did a similar room at the George Daggett House in Minneapolis, which was located on, I think, Groveland Terrace near the Walker right now. You see, here's a very similar dining room, round table, same furnishings, stenciling on the ceiling, and a very similar lamp. It has, again, the Egyptian revival look, the fringe, and the slag glass. So two different houses, very similar, same designer at the same time. Back to the exterior. Again, more photos from the family. And the one on the left here is, I think, a house next door which might be the Gregory entrance because the sidewalk looks a little different. Uh, we have now the footpath and the road is gone, but you can see a boathouse in the distance and just a beautiful lateen rig sailboat out here enjoying the breezes. The photo on the right is coming from a later homeowner, uh, the Donald Pomeroy family. You can see his name here, stapled, I guess it would be nailed to the tree off of our Cola Lane. This is the back of the house as it occurred in the 1950s. And I thank Liz Van Dam and the Historical Society, the West, West Tonka Historical Society for finding this photograph. So it was able to shed light on how the house is probably gonna look for the present owner taking it back. Right now, on this side of the house where these trees are is a big two-story addition with a three-car garage underneath and it's a blank facade and it hides this view of the house. Uh, we kind of think it might be coming down in order to put the house back to its, its former state here. Again, I thank the family for sharing those photos because these haven't been seen in quite a while. Here's a picture of the tunnel. So we mentioned the tunnel was lined in brick, wide enough for two people and 140 feet going from the house out to the boathouse. And underneath all the trees and overgrowth, we found a photo, um, thanks again to Liz, of the door entrance to the boathouse, which does not exist. We've been looking and looking and looking for pictures of the boathouse. So if anybody has any that might've belonged to this house, we'd sure appreciate it. Um, I understand that you cannot build a boathouse anymore at Minnetonka Beach, unless it's floating in some way, shape, or form. But it still would be good to have pictures to know what it indeed looked like. 
Now to the piece de resistance of this particular house that has so fascinated me and the family. And this is the Japanese garden. West Tonka, thank you again for a wonderful postcard that you had. This was sent, uh, created by the Sweet Studios in 1909, showing this garden. And it is the homeowner's, current homeowner's idea that she wants to restore this garden. And if that's true, then this will be the only Bradstreet garden that exists. And it would just be a lovely addition to Minnetonka Beach and to Lake Minnetonka. It has traditional lanterns, plants, water. There is some curbing here, a moon bridge, and going back to a tea house, which was thatch roofed with um, cane and bamboo. We have strategically placed boulders and rocks, a source of water. And this little creature here is actually a very tall creature and it is a bronze crane. The description, Mr. and Mrs. John Burkholz have laid out a charming bijou Japanese tea garden near their handsome summer home at the beach. A cup of tea served in the quaint little tea house at the foot of a lily pond and fountain will be enjoyed on many an afternoon and evening by their friends. The place is very attractive, and the pond winding its way under a small rustic bridge and among dainty paths is outlined with quaint plants and trees and huge bronze birds contrast effectively with the branches of northern oak and pine. And the Japanese gardens have traditional features, and I'm not the expert on Japanese gardens, but I know their traditions go back thousands of years. And there are basically sev several elements that you need in the Japanese garden. You need water, whether it be dry or wet. And I say that because you may have seen some stone gardens where they meticulously rake the stones to look like ripples in the water. A resting shed for contemplation, or sometimes a tea house, or sometimes it's combined as both. Each stone has important placement and meaning, and there is books and books written on this topic, but you can uh, select out certain things and elements that you want in your garden. The guardian stone is always the part of the ridge from which water falls over. Stone of worship is the best place to contemplate the garden. A sentinel stone marks the outlook on the water's edge. A water receiving stone actually is in the water and uh, sticking out and the water goes around it. And there's usually a bridge or stepping stones for passage and there's trees. In the Japanese garden all these have meaning and sometimes gardeners will look for years to find the right rocks and the right boulders. So we come to our garden and I'm going to show you photographs that I was able to obtain from a descendant of Eugenie Burkholz. She had children but her children did not have any children. Her brother uh, was Richard Andros and his uh, daughter, Georgiana Andros, married to Anson Brooks, which is a famous name that some of you may know from Minneapolis history. They built a home on Park Avenue. They also built the Anson Brooks house at Minnetonka Beach. So this was her uh, niece and her niece's son was Paul Brooks. So be her great nephew, was an avid photographer and he had the best of equipment and he could develop his own photographs. And what he did is he came out to photograph their house and also the, the pond. At one point, he had asked a family friend whose name was Alice Moe. She was a budding actress in Minneapolis. And this is about 1913 to 1914. So talkies were not quite there yet. You had silent films, you had Theta Barrow, and you had Mary Pickford dressed in these filmy gowns with crimped long hair and circlets holding their hair back. And so he invited her to come out dressed that way so he could photograph her in the pond, in the area. So here we go. These photos haven't been shown by anybody outside the family. So you're the first people to have seen these photographs in the public. So we have Alice Mo uh, on the left-hand side on the bridge. And we can see this nice bridge with this beautiful tea house. See much better the bird and the placement of everything here. Here she is on the right hand side looking at the water lilies that are blooming and you can see this bronze crane. The water itself in the pond is never more than two feet deep 
So it's like one or two feet throughout the whole area to take advantage of this low lying space. Here's a picture of our homeowner, Eugenie, and her niece, Georgiana Brooks, and a companion to Miss Brooks named Miss Russell, always known as Miss Russell. And they're seated in the garden during one of their fates they're holding. Back to Alice Mo. She's stepping across the stepping stones in the garden. You can see the lanterns, different placements of the rocks. The photo on the right is maybe a little blasphemous from a Japanese point of view because you wouldn't participate so much uh, in standing on these important rocks and boulders within the garden, but it does make for a nice photo and there's a nice reflection of her in the water. I am totally not sure what this object is here. It looks to me like a dead tree that has been made into a planter. Very contrived. It would not be part of any Japanese garden that we would know of today because it doesn't blend into mother nature, but they must have enjoyed it. At the time, Bradstreet was busy helping other gardeners, and I did find a picture of the James Ford Bell House at Ferndale with a similar, um, not as elaborate, but definitely the moon bridge, and there are some birds in this picture as well. Um, I don't think this garden exists either. Um, I've been looking at Ferndale and there's not much that still exists from its original uh, build. And here we have another picture of John Scott Bradstreet and his own crafts garden. What I want to show here was that same plank bridge, but here's another bronze bird with its wings outstretched, like bending over looking for either fish or water. And you can see its reflection in the water. So typically he would have a pair of the cranes within his landscapes that he was building. Back to Alice Mo, again looking at the pond. Doesn't she look very theta bearish? It's very interesting. She was married to uh, another actor in Minneapolis who was known as the youngest actor to portray Little Lord Fauntleroy here in, in Minnesota theatrical history. They did go off to Hollywood uh, to live in California, but I never was able to find her or them in any particular uh, well-known movie. They might have served as actors and actresses in the background, extras, et cetera, but nothing that went on to become fame and fortune. There's another view um, on the left-hand side of the garden from above in the piazza. And this is looking out towards the Gregory residence with the bamboo fence. And back here would be the tree house, um, I'm sorry, the tea house. This is as it appears today. Um, so you can see it's all filled in. There's just evidence of the curbing. Everything had been overgrown and just buried. Nobody really even knew that this garden existed under here. Um, but they were curious about what was happening. My job was to discover all of these photographs so the garden could be restored. Again, another view from the porch. Back over to the left here is the remnants of where the tea house was. So this was the footing. It was about six by 10 feet. Um, so not real huge, but enough that you could, two people can enjoy um, sipping and looking at the garden and the house from there. The house, uh, Miss Burkholz actually died in 1932. Her son took over the house briefly for about two years and then he sold it to the Donald Lane Pomeroy family who occupied the house until 1984. So they were there almost, I guess that'd be 50 years. But the gardens just deteriorated over time and then were buried under overgrowth. This is a picture of the tea house from 1938 when the, Bur when the Pomeroys owned the house. And you could see that it's starting to lose its thatch. It's not being very well maintained at all. And then a close up of where the footings were where all the green is, is where the water would have come lapping up to the tea house. Donald Lim Pomeroy uh, was born 1936, or he owned the house, I'm sorry, from 1936 to 1984. He was employed as the chief legal counsel to the Minneapolis Investor Syndicate, which bought and sold properties, but he died suddenly in 1950. This house was their summer home and they had a 
a regular home in the cities. But after his death, then his wife, who was Jessamine McMillan, daughter of Frank Griggs McMillan, decided to move the family permanently to the beach and sold the other house in town. Another picture, he's quite the handsome gentleman here, and a picture of Jessamine McMillan. I don't, this is a younger picture, so I don't think it's taken at the beach since they bought the house in 36. And this looks like a much earlier picture of her. After they sold the house in 1984, uh, it became the property of Roland Curtis Amundsen, who was a juvenile judge in Hennepin County, and then he went on to become Minnesota Court of Appeals Justice. Unfortunately for Mr. Amundsen, um, he was charged with embezzling from a trust fund for a young woman, daughter of a friend, and he was caught and sentenced to three and a half years, I believe, in Stillwater Prison. And he lived in this house from about 1984 to 1988. And at that point in 2001, he was convicted and sent to jail. He died in 2017. The house next went to the hands of the James Speakers or Spikers family, who was a sports marketing uh, guy, he lived here about six years. And then about year 2000, it went to the Martin Reeder family who lived here and raised their children. They built the new addition on the back of the house uh, with the drive and the, guard, the garages so that they could entertain uh, their children and family. Uh, sadly, Mr. Martin Reeder died um, young as well, and his family lived there a little bit longer and then sold the house. In 2016, or attempted to sell the house in 2016, and it sat empty for a little bit before our present homeowner acquired the house. And our present homeowner is the Reverend Betsy Parker. She's an Episcopal priest now. She was, as I mentioned, she's the sister of John Parker, the realtor from Coldwell Banker, who got me started on this project. Grew up in Minneapolis, went to Southwest High School, was an avid sportswoman and had horses, show jumping, training, et cetera. Uh, went to Boston, New York, and now lives in Middleburg, Virginia, the heartbeat of the thoroughbred and the horse showing industry. But she's been an advocate for children and youth throughout the world, particularly in Africa, and participated in the Pope's Council. Um, and so recently, this year, she's been appointed to delegate the United Nations General Assembly and the African Union She's also a senior member of the macroeconomist Dr. Jeffrey Sachs' American and African Think Tanks on Sustainable Development. So we're going to see more of her involved in uh, the world stage, I guess. The reason this picture is here is recently, I think it was last year, she actually acquired a castle in Scotland, northern Scotland, and along with that came a title. So she's also known as the Baroness of Lochiel. So Minnetonka Beach, you now have a baroness who comes and stays at uh, the lake in the summer times. Her goal is to return the house to its glory. Not only is a place for herself to stay, but she also is concentrating on returning the Japanese garden to its former glory as well, which I'm excited about. Then it would represent what John Scott Bradstreet's legacy um, to Minnesota is. We have two other Japanese gardens at the Como Conservatory and Normandale Community College has a wonderful Japanese garden as well. And this will be a private residence garden that will just be wonderful to see its restoration over time. So I thank you for the opportunity to share some of my research, um, the ongoing restoration project of this house. And I look forward to maybe coming back and sharing its legacy and how it's turned out in the future. Thank you. Kathy, that's amazing. You did amazing work on that house. Thank I you. Love, it was fun. I love the name of your business, If Your Walls Could Talk. That's wonderful. Certainly these walls are talking because you help them talk. That's astonishing, the amount of history that you did. I'm glad that our Historical Society and Liz Vandom were able to help as well. They were. I really appreciate that. And um, I thank Ancestry.com for 
tuning me into the uh, descendant of Eugenie Burkholz because without her, I couldn't have had those pictures and know what it looks like. It For took sure. months to find her, but she has more pictures to share too. Wonderful. So how in the world did you become interested in house histories? What got you started, do you think? Um, I guess when I moved to Minneapolis, um, interested in the history here, which was in 1980, but I wasn't able to, after I got married and I bought a house that was 100 years old, it was also built in 1904 in the Uptown area. I guess you call it the Wedge, um, the Sowery Hill East. And I started being interested in the history of my house because it had quite the storied history. And as I learned that, um, I would tell people about it and they said, oh, well, what can you find out about my house? And it just kind of mushroomed from there. So one, one connection led to the next one, perhaps. Correct. And then I started doing, um, I heard about walking tours through Preserve Minneapolis, and I signed up to do a couple of those about my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And that led me to more and more houses. And uh, one of them was Mod Hart Lovelace, who I found out lived in my neighborhood. So I went, researched that, did some history in that. And then the word just got out and started writing articles as I found research and interesting people. Because to me, every house has a story. It doesn't have to be this grand mansion that you think of. It's everybody contributed to the history in the city. Wonderful. And I certainly would agree with that. I've done just a little bit of school history locally and everyone has a story and everyone knows someone else who has a story and so I understand what you're saying when one thing leads to the next. Exactly. It's like an octopus with tentacles. It is. You have to, you have to write it down. <laughs> you can't go there right now. I've got to focus on this one. Yes. Well, you're still at a stage where you're willing to keep adding to the octopus. I finally said, I'll go to a particular year in the school history, and that will be the end of my research. The difficulty is I keep finding relatives of those folk that I interviewed who have stories, of course, to tell, which is wonderful. So have you, has your research taught you anything about our Lake Minnetonka area particularly? Have you done more than one house in Lake Minnetonka? I, uh, not really. I've concentrated mostly in Minneapolis and St. Paul. I did do one house off of Baker Road and Williston Road, which led me to discover why it was called Williston Road and Baker Road. Mm. I couldn't find any people named Williston. Sure. And it turned out it was planted by Willis Baker. Um, ah. So his name was Willis, his last name was Baker, sure. <laughs> and Willis then became that Baker Road. Um, so that was an interesting history there. Certainly the story that you told about the families that lived in this house talked a lot about the Lake Minnetonka uh, as a destination for people to come in the summertime and then go home or go someplace warm in the winter or go back into Minneapolis for the winter. And that was part of what taught me about uh, James J. Hill. He was not just the railroad magnet who connected east to west. He also was concerned with his local history. Of course, he was buying land and selling it and making money that way. But he connected Minneapolis residents to, the, to what was Lake Minnetonka. Mm -hmm. I used to spend my summers in Chautauqua Lake and was in, in New York State. Huh. And that had a similar feeling where the wealthy would come out for the summer and go to the mm -hmm. Chicago Institute, which they still do today. And I've met many people who remember those fond memories um, of going there. And so it was similar to find that people from Minneapolis were going out to Minnetonka Beach and going to the Apple, which is now St. Martin's by the lake. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. to be connected to that historic structure and how James J. Hill moved the trains and the railroad would came to get there. For sure. Taught me quite a bit about opening up that area. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, we appreciate your offer to come back when the uh, renovation maybe is worked on or completed and give us an update. We would oh, love I'm, to have you do that. I would love to, to do that. And I would hope that I'd be able to participate in the renovation of that. Um, That's we wonderful. try to find a landscape architect work with it and mm -hmm. bring it forth. Terrific. Well, thank you again. We really appreciate your time. And th the uh, video will be in the archives at the museum for folk to view. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.
You're welcome. Thank you.